Hello class and welcome to our last week of lecture. Um, as you can see, we actually have two lectures this week. In order to talk about neurological music therapy, we really have to talk about music neuroscience in order to understand how and why the techniques work. When I do these lectures in person on campus, each of them takes over an hour, and rather than recording two hours of lecture for you to watch this week, uh, what I'm going to be doing is um, I've posted these online for you to go through, and actually hopefully you've already browsed through them. Um, and then I'm just going to talk about some key points from, from uh, both of them, just the main things that I want you to know. I've purposely put in more information in these than you need to know for the purposes of our class. Um, I've added extra information just so that you, you can have a global understanding and, and be able to put everything together. So don't worry about memorizing all these different parts of the brain and where music is activated. Don't worry about that. I want you to be thinking more big picture. And then also for the neurological music therapy lecture, um, kind of the same idea. You don't have to memorize um, you know, what techniques are used for what problems. You should kind of have an understanding of, well, um, you know, this technique using singing is not for gait training, it's for, you know, speech or language. So you should be able to differentiate in that way, but not memorize um, the specifics. So, so, anyway, so first, we're going to talk about uh, music and neuroscience. And uh, we've got a few videos to watch for this. And um, there are also some in the other lecture. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to access them through the PowerPoint when you view that. Um, I'll put a PDF of it and you can just copy and paste the video um, links from that. Otherwise, I'll just post them separately. Uh, but anyway, so first we're going to talk about um, music neuroscience. And so the musical brain. And the brain is, you really can't think of it as musical. Don't worry about this terminology. What it's saying is that music is processed throughout the brain. There is no one little spot in the brain where all of music is processed. Um, a long time ago, that's what we thought was happening, was that just one side, really, one area on one side was where it was happening, that there was this music center. Um, but now we know for sure, because of functional MRI imaging, that music um, activates parts of the brain all over um, all over the brain, not just in the cortex, but also in, in deeper regions too. Um, the newest theory is that um, there's not a, a music center, we know that's not true, but that might, maybe there's a music network, that there is a network um, that is just for music. Um, but that's still something that has to be tested. So main thing, main concept is that music is stored throughout the brain, multiple parts of the brain. And that's why it works for so many different things. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through all of these, but you should go through them. A lot of this stuff is really interesting, especially if you have a musical background. And um, it really can help you see that, yes, music is... when. When you listen to a piece of music or when you play a piece of music, yes, it's a nice experience. It's a nice experience to play, a nice experience to listen. But um, something else is going on. There's a physiological response. There's a neurological response where um, parts of your brain are activating. Um, it's causing release of hormones. Um, so it's not just this nice fluffy thing. Um, things are happening in the brain. So it's not just um, for aesthetic experience, which is very important. That's why we still have music. Um, it's rewarding to listen to. But there's a physiological response too. That's why we can say that it's beneficial for even a patient who's not really conscious. So a patient in a coma, even if they're not singing, even if they don't seem to res be responding outwardly, we know that music is still activating parts of their brain. So I want you to be going through and just reading all of these and kind of, I hope the key message that you get from looking at all these slides is that all the different specific elements of music are 
activated in different parts of the brain. Um, so I hope that you, you can see that. I do want to talk about this for a minute. So the reason why it's important for a music therapist and someone working with a music therapist, say a nurse or physician or other therapist, the reason it's important for us to know where music is activated is because of these reasons. First, it helps with assessment. Okay, so for example, um, I have a patient that I see individually in her home. She has something called PIX dementia. And a few months ago, I had gone to see her and she had declined significantly. They didn't know why at that point. And I noticed when I was assessing her, um, I was doing a pretty formal assessment, um, unplanned, um, but because she had declined, I needed to see what her needs were again. So as I was doing the assessment, I noticed that when I tried to get her to track an instrument that she couldn't track it on her left side. And that was something that was new. And it turned out, we found out the next week after she did got some scans done, that she had a brain bleed in the back part of her brain, which is where vision, um, where your vision um, is, is um, how do we say it? That's where it's processed, we'll say. Um, <clears throat> but the brain bleed had occurred in that part of the brain that made it difficult for her to track to that side. Um, the same side I had noticed she couldn't track to when I was assessing her. So because I understood the neuroanatomy of all of that, I was able to realize that I had actually <clears throat> sort of assessed where the damage was because of the musical assessment that I conducted. Um, the scan just confirmed that that's where the brain bleed was. But through my assessment, I was actually able to figure out where um, the brain bleed had happened. Now, in the moment, I didn't know um, that it had been a brain bleed. We didn't really know that. But anyway, um, that's one example. Um, and then also it helps with treatment plan goals and objectives. So we're able to take those elements of music and figure out what parts of the brain we need to um, make better. And we can select the elements of music that activate that part of the brain. And we use that when we design our music interventions so that it's not just random, it's not just a random use of music, it's very, very purposeful and intentional. Um, why the music works. <coughs> um, so, when part of the brain is damaged, um, that brain doesn't work. That part of the brain doesn't work anymore. So, for example, um, a classic example I'll give: um, when someone has a stroke and they have something called Broca's aphasia, that occurs because the Broca's area of the brain. There's actually an area of the brain called Broca's area. Um, that part of the brain doesn't work anymore, and so and it's it's a big problem because that has to do with expressive speech. When someone has Broca's aphasia, um, they have a lot of trouble talking. It's hard to understand them. Um, but um, if they sing, they can clearly sing. Uh, you can understand the lyrics as if there was no damage. Well, why is that happening? How can that be possible that they can't speak like they used to, but they can sing like they used to? The reason for that is because, again, music is stored in many parts of the brain. And so even though that part of the brain is damaged, because there's also another part of the brain where we sing a different part, we can actually make a pathway around the damaged area and create a new area for speech. <clears throat> There's also this idea of shared networks. So although music activates many parts of the brain, none of those parts are just for music. So um, and I have some examples of this at the end of the lecture, which I'm not going to go over, but they show non-musical functions of each part of the brain or some of the parts of the brain. I didn't go through all of them. But for example, there are parts of the brain that are responsible for speech that are also um, activated by music. 
Um, there are parts of the brain for um, uh, fine motor that are also activated by music. There are parts of the brain for, um, for we'll say, um, large motor like walking that are also activated by, the, by uh, music. So uh, we call that a shared network when a part of the brain is activated or responsible for two different things, music and non-musical. Um, let's see. So I've already kind of talked about this, but so the idea of music is that we can use it to optimize brain functioning and to also help facilitate some of that plasticity um, that you've probably heard a lot about, which is the idea of the brain um, when an area is damaged, um, we try to build a new area for that same functional skill. Okay, so um, go through these. Um, I've posted this video, it's super cool. Um, it shows jazz musicians playing in an fMRI. It's really neat to watch. Um, and then I've got a few other videos. These kind of go in a specific order, so from music neuroscience to this idea of music medicine, music directly treating um, something, to connecting neuroscience and music therapy. Um, I want you to be thinking of this idea of, you know, music neuroscience is really, really new. Music therapy has been around a lot longer than music neuroscience. Um, but the actual specialization of music neuroscience is very, very new. Um, interestingly enough, though, there's a lot of research on it because there is quite a bit of interest in it. Um, I posted a list of some of the research, and it's, it's pretty lengthy. Um, there's been a lot of studies. But I want you to be thinking of um, how do the two work together? And in this, this video, um, he talks a little bit about how music therapy can influence music neuroscience and vice versa, and how we can work together to, um, to learn more and obviously to make music therapy um, uh, even more beneficial and to understand, not just make it more beneficial, I shouldn't say that, but to understand why it works because we're just still learning why it works. <clears throat> um, the rest of these slides, like I said, are just to show um, non-musical functions um, for different parts of the brain. So you can go um, through these too. So um, I'm going to go ahead and cut off this and um, we'll restart and do a part two.